This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by Swords of Might, the official Shadowversity affiliate sponsor. Swords of Might is one of the very best online retailers for all your swordy, fun, awesome, bladey, swordy stuff, needs, things, swords. That was a ruined pitch. But anyway, I'm going to keep going because that's what I do. I have a very extensive range and awesome attitude of always showing that the items that they display on the website are in stock and available. So if you are in a position where you want to buy a sword, please use the affiliate link in the description below so you'd be supporting Shadowversity without spending any more money and getting the very same sword that you were wanting to get in the first place. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I've said for a good couple of years now that I would much rather know the truth than be right. And so that simply means if I'm wrong about something, I'd rather be wrong and know the truth and be corrected than to continue on in ignorance. I say this in the very trailer to this YouTube channel, and there has been many instances in the past where people have presented sound logic and evidence that has persuaded me that I've been wrong about things. But it takes that, okay? Sound logic, reason, and evidence. And when it's clear to see that I'm wrong, well, it's easy to accept it. In fact, I am more than happy to. So with that in light, I hope you can see that I'm not necessarily a pushover when it comes to my views, okay? If I think someone's counter-argument is flawed and doesn't answer all the points that I have, of course, I will defend my my views and explain why I think they are wrong. And it's interesting how many of those things will come down to a difference of opinion, and I could show that it comes down to an opinion-based thing with logic, reason, and evidence. Many people can remain passionately convinced that I am spreading misinformation and that I'm not a reliable source on the topics that I talk about. Well, I always encourage people to look into things themselves and try and substantiate any of the things that I say. Don't take my word as gospel ever, but I try my best. And if I get things wrong along the way, well, I do my best to correct it, which is what brings us to the subject of this video. Some people have disagreed with my views and the way I've expressed my views regarding the prominence and prevalence of leather armour in the medieval period. Now, I have heard some of the arguments that people have proposed regarding my views on leather armour in certain random comments that I just happened to see, but I've not been fully convinced of their arguments to this point, and one of the reasons that uh, I think there was a flaw in the logic or the evidence wasn't there, but I was certainly open to listening to them, but I can't reply to every single comment because that would be a full-time job. But when someone goes to particular effort to really outline a solid argument with uh, sources listed and things like that, that's where I feel it's appropriate to make an official response, which is what this video is. A Reddit user by the name of Hergrim has posted a article on the subreddit Bad History, I think it was, according to memory, accusing me of being categorically wrong in my views of leather armour and spreading misinformation and being an unreliable source overall, or just generally, not overall on everything, but generally unreliable. And he actually raises some really interesting points that I want to go through in detail. So I'll link to the Reddit article in the description below, and I have confidence that you guys will be civil, okay, because the community here on Shadowversity are actually awesome. You guys are awesome, and I have faith in you uh, to keep remaining and being awesome. Don't attack the guy or anything like that. And in any way, I'm going to be addressing his arguments here. I won't be putting up a lot of graphics in this video because this is a more in-depth just discussion between me, my viewers, and also Hergrim. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. But he opens up his article with this. I've recently been thinking a lot about the medieval Western European use of leather armor and the counterculture pop historian trend of denying its existence beyond limb armor. Now, I pause there because that's already been taken out of context in regards to what I have said in particular on limb armor. But is he referring to me? Well, yes, quite specifically, because in the next sentence he continues, since Shadowversity is one of the worst offenders in this regard, especially when it comes to arrogantly asserting his case with poorly thought out thought experiments, and also one of the most popular, I appreciate that you think I'm popular, I don't appreciate the, the arrogant thing, but I guess that comes down to uh, personal opinion. If you want to think I'm arrogant, that's fine, but bringing it up in, in, in a, an argument, that's a bit immature, actually, uh, because it's basically ad hominem. I mean, if you want to state I'm arrogant, that really has no relevance to the argument at hand. What you're actually trying to do is to vilify me, admittedly, very, very minorly, okay? People have said much meaner things about me on the internet, and this is the only, you know, negative or derogatory thing he says about me in the entire article. So, because most of it is void of that, I can overlook it and, you know, just, all right, so, yeah, you think I'm arrogant? And then he ends this paragraph, I thought I'd tackle his videos on the subject. Now, the main thing that I have a problem with in this statement is that I deny the existence of leather armour beyond limb armour. 
And this is contradicted explicitly by my very own words in the videos. Now he references two videos specifically, why Gambeson is way better than leather armor, and my previous video before then, the truth about the Gambeson, Ackerton, and leather armor. So since the main point of his Reddit article is to establish the existence of leather armor, something that I have not denied at all, in fact that I have also said leather armor did exist, as to the prevalence of it, that's something that we disagree on, but is taking the stance that I have flat out denied its existence beyond Lynn armor, he is mostly arguing against a straw man in this discussion. A straw man is a misrepresentation and oftentimes a oversimplification of someone else's opinions or counter argument to what they're saying. But the assertion that I've ever said that leather armor doesn't exist outside of limb protection, that's a complete misrepresentation. Because leather armor did exist in some cases. I talk about it more in my original video, so I'll let you have a look at that so I can save time here. In the clip that I just showed, I say explicitly that leather armor did exist in the medieval period, and I give a single example from as a picture and also text of limb armor, okay? You know, the leather braces and such. But at no point did I say it was limited to that. Ever. And in my first video on this subject, I also point out additional examples of leather armor existing, specifically lamella and also buff coats, they, they're outside the medieval period, but I have said on several occasions explicitly that leather armor did exist, okay, and in the medieval period. I haven't found many cases documenting authentic leather armor being used in the medieval period. Did I say I'd found no cases of authentic leather armor being used in the medieval period? No, I said I had not found many, meaning that I was aware of the few cases in which leather armor is documented to exist in the medieval period, which is an explicit acknowledgement on my part that leather armor did exist in the medieval period. Now, having said that, I've expressed the opinion fairly emphatically that I don't think it was very common, and clearly I need to allow elaborate on that a bit more. The evidence that some people have watched my videos and gotten the impression that I'm saying that leather armor didn't exist in the medieval period is proven by the fact that uh, the author of this reddit post has that view as well. I would encourage them to pay a bit more attention to my specific wording. Because the main thing that I'm trying to debunk is the Hollywood fantasy depiction of leather armor in the medieval period, specifically studded leather and also thin, flappy, you know, pieces of leather put together in this fantasy style. And that's the type of leather that I say is a load of bull. Leather armor, as we conventionally think of it, as depicted in medieval movies and stuff, is generally a load of bull didn't actually exist in, in the way that it's shown. And when I've made statements like this, I've just taken for granted that people would realize when I say that it didn't exist in this way, that that statement is clearly indicating that it did exist in other ways, just not the way that Hollywood generally depicts it. But I guess I just need to be a bit clearer. And then there's the way I express my views on the comparison between leather armor and its main contender, and the one I have an obvious personal bias to, Gambeson. I make a very strong statement in my video why Gambeson is way stronger than leather armor, where I go through a logical process looking at the availability of the materials, the ease of manufacturing, and also the repairability of the two types of armor, that with those things in mind, it would be absolutely ridiculous to make a piece of armor out of leather. It would be absolutely ridiculous to make a piece of armor out of leather in this context. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying it's ridiculous to make armor out of leather in every single circumstance. In the context that I mentioned specifically, in this context, in the comparison, in that context, I do still feel it is ridiculous because of how cost effective and stuff like that. But if the parameters were changed somewhat, for instance, uh, you have a soldier, okay? He might be a mercenary or whatever. He has some, you know, animals, livestock. They generally always have a plot of land, okay? That they're growing some type of veggies, a veggie garden, stuff like that in the medieval period. And it's not outside of the realm possibility. I might have a beast of burden, a cow, okay? And if that cow reached the end of his life, he wouldn't kill the cow just to get the leather to make armor. That's stupid, okay? But if the cow reached the end of its life then it would be a waste to not use the hide for something again if he already has shoes and is in a position where he needs armor and he can tan it i'll come back to the tanning thing because that's a more specialized task in and of itself but if he has the ease or ability to tan it into thick leather and it's appropriate for armor he now has it and it's cheaper and more available than the other stuff so of course why not make some armor out of that if he felt it was just as effective and there are certain circumstances where leather armor is easily as effective as gambeson but i think gambeson still 
well overall has be more beneficial properties. Now with that in mind, there will be of course other circumstances in which leather would be a more practical uh, conclusion to make armor out of, dependent on availability of resources, but in a general overview, I do not think that is the case. In this context. Now Hergrim, he challenges me on a couple of things and this is where I think it's going to be a bit more interesting as to the availability, uh, the difficulty in manufacturing and also the cost because those are significant elements that would change uh, my conclusion. In any regard, I think my opinion and stance on leather armor that it did exist in the medieval period is easily defensible by, you know, video record of what I have actually said, but that doesn't mean I'm incapable of misspeaking and not expressing my views as clearly as I I would have liked or hoped. And so I went back to my videos, rewatched them, double checked to make sure, did I ever, you know, misspeak? And the closest thing in which I've come to misspeaking on this subject was not the videos that is even referring to, so I don't even think has even seen this one, but it's when I'm addressing the subject in a collaboration between a couple of other creators within YouTube, you know, medieval creators and stuff. Now in that video, I say this. Was leather armor a thing in the medieval period? Well, to give you the broad, flat answer, no, it wasn't. I apologize for misspeaking, but I think I can validate myself because at the very end of that same video, I say this. And these are the reasons why leather armor, no, it wasn't really a prevalent thing in the medieval period at all. Meaning it still existed, but wasn't prevalent. Now, I can see how someone could, you know, mistake my overemphasis on that subject, so for that, I absolutely apologize. And so Hergrim continues in his Reddit post and he begins to summarize what he feels my main opinions are about leather armor. The first one being that I think there's no evidence for leather armor, which I hope I have just, you know, contradicted categorically because leather armor did exist in some cases. No, rather what I said was this. But then it kind of stops, all right? When you hit the medieval period, there aren't many historical examples of authentic leather armor. Now, of course, that can come down to the fact that it's leather, it's organic and it breaks down, it doesn't survive time very well. But we're also talking about historical artworks and things like that. The leather armor is not really featured a lot. You see gambesons, but you don't really see the leather armor thing. And that bit at the end where I say you don't really see that leather armor thing, what I'm actually saying, which is identified by the context of everything else that I'm referring to is that you don't really see leather armor as a prominent thing. So his next point is that he thinks that I feel that leather armor would be more expensive than textile armor. I've learned a bit more on that subject, that'll be an interesting one. And that uh, that a poor peasant would want to buy a gambeson so that they have something to wear with their mail if they can afford it. And so the bulk of the actual article now is him proving with you know certain sources here and there of references to leather armor. It's great, great, good to see, I, I don't disagree. And he concludes this section with this statement. What we can say though is that it, meaning leather armor, was quite widespread. I don't think we can say that. Not from the evidence that is put forward. All that does establish is that leather armor did exist in the medieval period, but not how prevalent it was. And you might say, ah, but look at all the references he lists. Th that's not a lot of references in regards to all the references we have to all the types of armor in the medieval period. It's actually rather few. But what about the linguistic evidence and the origin and meaning of the, you know, term cuirass? Now, a cuirass is the French word, essentially, for a breastplate, okay? And it generally refers to a metal breastplate in the modern day, but the queer in it is also the root and connected thing with cure in English. Cure, curing, leather, or also just means translates into leather. And so a cuirass is a breastplate or a protective covering, something you wear made out of leather or hide. Clearly indicating that the kind of plate protective, you know, um, breastplate that people wore at some point before metal was around was originally made out of leather. But that doesn't mean it was prominent or particularly common. It just means there was a word identifying its existence. Now you might say, well, why don't you apply that logic to everything in the medieval period? Anything that you have evidence of, you can't say how prevalent it was. Well, we have other things in regards to say Gambeson that help us establish a baseline of how prevalent it was. And that's the frequency in which it appears in artwork and also in archeological remains. And this is one of the reasons why I still think leather armor, it was less prominent in the medieval period. And I feel it's confirmed when you look at practical examples of just the advantages between the two materials and also cost, which we'll get to in a second. Now I have even said in my own 
own videos that uh, leather doesn't preserve too well. It's an organic material that breaks down, so I wouldn't expect to find many remains. Yet having said that, we do have, uh, you know, archaeological remains of leather items from the medieval period in rather large abundance. Shoes, leather straps, sword scabbards, belts, and items of clothing. Not, not armor, but items of leather clothing. And those archaeological remains are in greater abundance than the archaeological remains we have of leather armor. And I've never said there were no archaeological remains of leather armor from the medieval period. I said this. But then it kind of stops, all right? When you hit the medieval period, there aren't many historical examples of authentic leather armor. I said there wasn't many, and that is very true. There aren't many at all. In fact, the only archaeological piece of leather chest armor, specifically, that I found that dates from the medieval period is this piece right here. This artifact is referenced in a paper that I found entitled A Poor Man's Armor, Late Medieval Leather Armor from Excavations in the Netherlands. I'll try and find the link for it and put it in the description below. There is another piece that people tend to try and cite, but this one is actually too thin to be real leather armor, and people have concluded that it was actually sewn on top of something else, like linen, cloth, or whatever, but basically it was the top of a garment. And it could have been armor in that instance, but by itself, no, it's not thick enough to be armor. Now, could it be that leather armor was as prominent as, say, gambits and other pieces of armor in the medieval period, and most of the archaeological remains have just been deteriorated over time and they don't exist anymore, far more so than the other leather pieces that have survived? And for some reason, the armor just got the, you know, attack of time more so. Is that more likely? Or is it more likely that it just wasn't as prevalent? Because the contrasting bit to this is the artistic evidence, okay? Now, there is artistic evidence of leather the armor, but it is not very much, okay? What is more likely? Is it more likely that leather armor just was ignored artistically more so than other armors, and in the actual medieval period it was as prominent? Or is it more likely that it simply wasn't as prominent? I think the latter is the more likely conclusion. And the references to leather armor that we have from historical sources and in linguistic origins, okay, is just the actual acknowledgement that it did exist, but that doesn't, you know, reference to the actual prevalence of it. So the conclusion that Hergram reaches at this section of the article that leather armor was widespread in the medieval period, I disagree with. I think that's a fairly big assumption. But what do we mean by widespread? Because perhaps we're just getting our contextualization of widespread differently, okay? If he is saying widespread in the sense that, I don't know, 10% uh, of the armor of the medieval period, uh, you could likely expect to find to be leather armor, and everyone knew that it existed, and he thinks that's widespread, well, then would probably agree, okay? Because, yeah, that's, that's possible, okay? But when I hear widespread, I generally think that it's the more prominent type, at least 50% or most of the people use. Using it. And Hergrim also seems to, you know, indicate fairly, you know, uh, explicitly is that leather armor is the cheaper type of armor that people could make. Therefore, it was the entry level armor that the average soldier wore. That last part, that it was therefore the entry level part, that's an extrapolation I make from his belief and statement that leather armor was cheaper. And if it was cheaper, that would make sense. But I don't think it is. Okay, if we're saying widespread that everyone knew it existed, we can agree there. I do not think it was widespread in the sense that it was the most prominent type, or the cheapest type, that the most soldiers wore. No, 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 no. I, I completely disagree with that view. I think Gambeson is still the best and cheapest entry level. Now, let me explain why it's cheap. Because uh, Herogrim actually goes to some pretty impressive sources listing the cost of linen in the medieval period and the cost of leather, and he gives some sources, uh, some Italian sources as well. The problem is, okay, uh, because I, I, this actually, this honestly made me question myself. I was like, all right, he might have a point here, uh, but I need to double check everything. And look, if, if when I double checked it and I confirmed what he was saying, I would withdraw my opinion on this and I might have to reassess my views. Is leather armor far more prominent than what I'm willing to acknowledge? But as I look further into it, there is a very significant point that has to be raised in the discussion of the cost of linen. And in all honesty, it's not one that I've even brought up, because even in my other videos, I think I'm more generally saying that linen is just cheap, which it, that's a, I misspoke there. I'll, I'll correct myself in that regard. No, okay. Linen can be quite expensive and it can be quite cheap, depending on how it's made. This question was actually answered for me by Professor Greg Aldretti in his lecture on padded type armor of the classical period, okay, you know, ancient Greece. I'll link to his article in the description below, it's really good, because that 
that question between what about leather or you know textile armor comes up in that discussion in the exact same context. Now he doesn't state a particular view as to which was more prevalent in the classical period like I am saying in the medieval period which I am drawn to this conclusion based on logic evidence and my own thought processes but he does certainly address the cost thing and so I'll let him explain this for us. Sometimes the idea of linen armor is questioned or challenged on the grounds that linen was expensive and hard to obtain. And it is true that certain linens had a reputation as being somewhat of a luxury fabric in the ancient world. Uh, there were places such as Egypt which were renowned for producing expensive, very fine linen for the high-end market. However, there were a lot of coarse linens floating around as well. Uh, the flax plant from which linen is made was cultivated in nearly every region of the Mediterranean from Spain to the Near East, even in quite unlikely places such as Germany. Uh, linen is one of the oldest and most widely used textiles. There are finds from Israel, Anatolia, and Syria that date to at least 7,000 BC. Ancient sources praise flax for the ease with which it can be grown, uh, its ability to flourish even in marginal environments, and linens of varying quality and fineness of weave were mass produced and used for an array of even humble purposes. Uh, such as fishing nets, clothing, curtains, tents, bandages, and sails. Basic linens were a standard project manufactured in many, perhaps most, ordinary households by their female members. And these sort of coarse linens would have been nearly ubiquitous in the ancient world and fairly cheap. Uh, another leading candidate, by the way, for uh, Type 4 armor is leather. And the argument for that often seems to rest on a belief that leather would be cheaper and more available than linen, uh, rather than being based on really solid textual evidence. But if you look at things like Diocletian's price edict and other price lists, uh, the leather of the appropriate sort, that's a very thick type that's derived from the back of an oxen, and that's what's best for making armor, that was very expensive leather. Uh, unlike linen, which could have been produced entirely by the members of a typical household, armor quality leather would probably have required the specialist services of a tanner and would probably have to have been bought. Uh, certainly in some regions where cattle were common uh, and therefore leather was common, uh, I think people would have used this for armor, but in many other regions it would have been quite rare. If you go online and search for hand-spun, hand-woven linen, you can find a lot of it. But if you look into it a little bit deeper, you'll find that most of that hand-spun, hand-woven linen has actually been made from flax plants that were machine processed and treated with modern chemicals, which actually changes the composition of the textile. Our hand-woven, hand-spun, hand-processed linens consistently perform 10 to 15% better than modern linen. And at first this puzzled us, <clears throat> but eventually we figured out what's going on is that uh, flax fibers in the plant are encased in a kind of waxy pectinous matrix. And if you process that in traditional ways, some of that waxy gumminess survives. And when you process it by modern chemical means, all of that's stripped away. And so our authentic slabs had a slight gummy texture, which ended up substantially increasing the protection they offered to the wearer. So the authentic linen uh, was definitely better than the modern one. So that is really interesting. Linen can be made in a much cheaper way. And in fact, the cheap type of linen is better for armor production. That is significant, you know, because the wax thing and stuff like that. And it also is more coarse, okay? If you ever handled, you know, unrefined linen, it's very coarse and stronger as a result. And the fact that it gets stronger when it's wet is another big bonus benefit for linen on top of that. And on top of this, you also have the fact that leather comes from many different types of animals and then even from the same animal, it still has different levels of quality. And that the best type of leather that makes good armor comes from a certain part on the cow is significant, but I don't think that means you couldn't make leather out of the other parts of the cow, like, you know, rawhide is pretty tough. But you wouldn't want to make leather out of pig hide or anything like that. And it's funny, pigs were grown and slaughtered at a much higher frequency than cattle in the medieval period because people ate pork far more than they ate beef. And then when looking through some of these forums, I've actually found some quotes from tanners, okay? T people actually, you know, tan leather, who have pointed out that the age of the cow also determines the quality of the leather when you kill it. And the optimal age in which you would want to kill a cow to get the best armor quality leather from it is well before it has reached the end of its usefulness. And the medieval period, as I have mentioned in one of my other videos, is that a cow is a very useful thing. 
thing for milk and also as a beast of burden. And so in most cases, you are going to use that cow until it dies of natural resource, get as much use out of it as possible, and then you're in a position to use the leather, but that leather is not in the most optimal state to make armor out of anymore. That's, it. That's interesting. And again, it's another point as to why leather might not be the best pick as an armor. I'm not saying it wasn't, but I think in the general, you know, comparison between the two, you get more benefits out of Gambeson in a general sense. I think there might be some specific circumstances where hardened leather into like some kind of solid thick plate, like a bit of hard plastic, could probably be more beneficial than Gambeson, but Gambeson has more beneficial properties overall, in a general sense. In this context. Now, I'm not saying that Gambeson is cheaper than leather armor in every instance. No, okay, you're gonna, of course, make it out of more expensive linen, okay? And in fact, there are some examples of Gambesons being made out of silk. <laughs> that would be very expensive. But the armor that's going to be most prevalent in the medieval period is the armor that's cheapest worn by the regular soldier, because what type of soldier comprises the bulk out of most armies? It's the regular average Joe soldier. And linen is more prevalent and more easily accessible to the average medieval person than uh, leather is. Now, I'm not saying leather isn't easily accessible, I'm just saying linen is more easily accessible. Ancient sources praise flax for the ease with which it can be grown, uh, its ability to flourish even in marginal environments, and linens of varying quality and fineness of weave were mass-produced and used for an array of even humble purposes. And in actual fact, most, you know, housewives and stuff like that, in regards to the standard medieval skills that housewives, you know, needed, weaving thread and making cloth seems to be one of them. Tanning, on the other hand? Not so much. That requires some more specialized skills and equipment. The average soldier generally will have the means to make his own gambeson or his wife, you know, good old, good old women don't doing the job for us guys. Oh gee, even that could be considered sexist in our uh, day and age. But, but hey, I know, I know my wife would be more than happy to make me a gambeson because I'm, uh, mainly I suck at sewing, you know. It's just, I don't know, guys, just generally we, we don't like the sewing stuff. Anyway, let's, let's move on. But in any regard, I think my point still stands that the average housewife in the medieval period has the capacity to produce the materials to make gambeson more so than leather armor. But if they were just, if they're outsourcing and just pot buying the materials, okay, it does seem that cheap linen is more affordable than the type of leather you would need to make good quality leather armor. And I think this is also confirmed by the fact that the artwork that shows leather armor that we can identify seems to be worn by knights. You don't see the average soldier wearing what we can clearly identify as leather armor. There are some examples of things that might be leather armor, like there's this shot from the Morgan Bible, but that, that's 50 feet. That could be leather armor or it could be really thick gambeson, in all honesty. And even the possible bits of evidence that exist outside of artwork, for instance, there is this effigy in which there's a breastplate underneath the knight's surcoat, and that breastplate could be leather. There's no way to prove it, but, but, but it's possible. Yet if it is, it's still being worn by a knight, which does seem to indicate that Leather armor, when used as armor, requires the more expensive type to make effective leather armor out of it and is more expensive to process that the rich were the ones who could afford it. And again, going back to the peasant thing, the peasants will already have linen available. They'll have linen for sheets, they'll have linen for their own clothing, stuff like that, and they're in a position where they need armor on the really cheap, okay? And they happen to have a couple of shirts. They generally didn't have like a wardrobe full of clothing, but if they could get their hands on a few shirts from, you know, people selling other shirts and stuff like that, and just, you know, sew them together as, you know, thick as possible, and they have a, you know, jury-rigged gambeson right there, made out of second-hand clothing. And the Reddit article then challenges me on my views on the repairability of, uh, you know, gambeson. And his main point is that it would be way too expensive because he feels that gambeson was expensive. But I think we have, you know, been able to contradict that point, that gambesons could be made out of much cheaper materials. And when it is made out of much cheaper materials, that validates the repairability of it. And even if you were to disregard the cost associated, which I don't think it would be as much as leather armor, it comes to the thing of how effectively you can actually repair leather armor or gambeson. When you sew linen together, it bunches up together, making a pretty solid kind of connection that if a sword tried to, you know, get through the gap, it's still going to be caught on the linen on either side like I was hitting solid linen. But with leather, if you, you, you'd have to overlap it a bit, which would make sewing a bit, but then there'd still be kind of gaps in between. Uh, it's simply put much 
much harder to patch leather armor than it is for Gambeson, drastically so, and the patchwork wouldn't be as effective as when it was in its solid state. But the patchwork you can do on a Gambeson restores its defensive value significantly. The author of the Reddit article does try and explore the uh, effectiveness of leather armor versus Gambeson, and he's obviously taking the point of view that he thinks uh, leather armor is superior to Gambeson. I disagree, okay? Um, I don't think the evidence that he brought to substantiate his views, that wasn't enough to convince me. Hergrim mentions that he found a test in which uh, Leather Arm performed better than Gambeson, and it's interesting because there are many tests which Gambeson performs better than Leather, and so obviously there are certain parameters which change up the effectiveness. The level of layers in the Gambeson obviously is one. The thing that was pointed out in the lecture that I linked below, the type of linen used will also affect how you know strong it is defensively. This is also kind of beside the point because I've always said that they are very comparable leather and you know a gambus in my video. I mentioned leather can stop arrows but also gambuson. Hergrim seems to imply that gambuson won't stop arrows which is incorrect. It sometimes will and sometimes will, won't, depending on circumstances, which is the same as leather armor as well. Hergrim does mention that in the uh, test that he is referencing, hardened leather, or cuir bully, uh, demonstrated quite well that it could significantly reduce the impact of blows when worn over some type of padding compared to when there's just the padding, but again, depends how much padding. And I'm not saying there aren't circumstances which leather, hardened leather and gambeson are beneficial, but that also doubles up the cost, okay? And if you can just add a few more layers to your gambeson and reach the same defensive value that leather and gambeson was providing, you would reach it at a lower cost, and therefore, why would you get the leather armor? Interesting, he mentions the test that I reference often about, you know, the Mike Lodes video clip that stops the arrowhead, and he says that even Mike Lodes has acknowledged that it didn't stop other arrowheads, and that, that's fine, I've never seen Said that Gambeson is completely impenetrable to arrow fire, just that it can resist arrow fire in certain circumstances. So that doesn't really contradict my point that, you know, I generally make. Certain things that we thought uh, would also matter didn't turn out to be so important. One thing that does matter is the angle that we shot at. Most of our shots were at a worst case scenario, 90 degrees just straight in. Uh, but on a real battlefield, the armor is curved, people would have been moving, arrows would have been coming in from an angle. And so not only would the arrow have had to penetrate a thicker expanse of armor if it hits an angle, but we found an unexpected benefit of this form of armor is that when an arrow came in at an angle, the tip of the arrow would almost get caught by the layers and start to divert between the layers. So it would almost be magically turned away from your body as it burrowed between two layers and expended its energy that way rather than penetrating straight through. This next point is one that other people have brought up and is worth acknowledging. And it's when in my first video I say that you, and I say it fairly explicitly, so too explicitly uh, in retrospect, I feel I should correct this and add more context to what I'm saying here. And I basically say that you would always want to get Gambeson because you always wear it under mail. Specifically, you always need some type of padding under the mail. You don't always need it, okay? Uh, in fact, just wearing a, a linen shirt and stuff like that would prevent the pinching and the chafing. But does that mean you would not want some type of padding under the mail? In my own opinion, I feel you would always at least want mail. It's not necessary in every circumstance. Of course you can wear mail without the padding, but you lose a very significant defensive parameter in this regard, and that's defense against blunt force blows, okay? Mail does not prevent, you know, blunt trauma going through, bones can be still be broken under mail if there's no padding in between. So padding is very beneficial. And this is where people have then brought up and said, the gambeson that you would wear under mail would never be as thick as a gambeson that would be made to be defensible by itself without mail. There was a big difference in the thickness. I agree, but also disagree. I, I think it's both. We can't definitively say that no one ever wore a fully thick gambeson under mail. I'm willing to bet money on the fact that someone in the past did it, okay? There are many circumstances in which a fully thick gambeson would be worn under mail. For instance, if they had nothing else, okay? They didn't have the half-thin one, but they wanted some measure of protection against blunt force. Well, of course, they would use whatever they had and put it under their mail. And then there's the fact that some people might actually want that extreme level of protection, okay? A fully thick gambeson that is very likely 
defend against, you know, slashes, pierces, and bow shots, and everything like that. It's good defending against blunt force. And then mail on top of that increases the protection to a very high level. You, you think no one in history would ever say they want that protection? Yes, it would be more bulky, it would be harder to move in. But you think no one ever did it at all? No, I think that's a disingenuous position. I'm sure someone in the past must have done it. Does that mean I think it was done more often than not? Well, I do apply that in my first video, and I am happy to admit that's incorrect. There's no way to know if it was the most prominent way to do it. And in actual fact, if I were to, if I was to make a call on what is probably more likely, the thinner gambesons worn under the mail are probably more likely. Of course, gambesons were worn over mail, and the author of the Reddit article emphasizes that point quite a lot. And it almost, like, maybe I'm misreading this one because, you know, it's a big article. Was he implying that Gambeson was never worn under mail? Because that is incorrect. Of course Gambeson was worn under mail. In fact, one of his own sources that he lists in his own thing explicitly says that Gambeson is worn under mail. Not in every instance, of course, but it's European armour by Claude Blair. And he states both, that it's worn over armour, and there are many cases of it being worn under armour as well. And so, if it's worn over armour, well then they get the padding defence, as well as the defence against piercing tacks and stuff like that. And in that instance, well of course they would only need some light, you know, linen or whatever, underneath the mail to prevent pinching and other things like that. And am I saying that no one ever wore mail on their bare skin? No, I'm not saying that either, because just as likely as someone wearing thick gambeson with mail on top of that, it's obviously just as likely that someone somewhere in history didn't have a shirt, but they got their hands on mail and just wore mail on bare skin. Of course, it's very likely to have happened at some point in the past. So, this has been a very long video, but I wanted to show my respect to Hergrim by addressing each and every one of his points in his rebuttal. I love that Hergrim and people like him go to the effort of making these really thought out arguments and rebuttals and discussions, stuff like that, because we're all after the same thing. We want to know what the truth was. And even in the end, if I haven't convinced Hergrim of my own opinions and we have a difference of opinion, that's fine, okay? We can have a difference of opinion. I appreciate Hergrim for taking the time to want to discuss these things, and of course, I appreciate you for listening and watching this video. Please remember to subscribe if you want to learn more about medieval stuff and also the times when I look at how it's integrated into pop culture, movies, TV shows and video games and click the bell notification if you don't want to miss an episode or video. I hope to see you there and until that time, farewell.